Three years ago, Juan Guaido declared himself Venezuela's leader instead of President Nicolas Maduro. Now the opposition has voted to remove the interim government led by the US-backed politician. And Maduro remains firmly in power despite years of sanctions and economic ruin. So what's next for Venezuela? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Imran Khan. It holds the world's largest oil reserves, yet Venezuela's economy remains in deep difficulty after years of Western sanctions. President Nicolas Maduro has stayed in power with support from Russia, Cuba, China, Turkey and Iran. Backed by the West, Juan Guaido declared himself president three years ago, but he's on the way out. That's after the opposition he proclaimed to lead this week rejected his leadership and interim government. In a few moments, we'll be looking in more detail with our guests on how Venezuela got where it is and where it goes next. But this first report from Alessandro Rampietti on the economic difficulties its people face. Adriana Garcia opened her natural cosmetic shop four months ago in Caracas, betting on Venezuela's moderate economic recovery. And despite many hurdles, she says things have gone well so far. It's an economy in revision that's just starting to grow again. There is a feeling of normality for commerce, and many shopping centres have started operating again. The government's decision to relax price controls and allow trading in US dollars has given some businesses and President Nicolas Maduro a second wind in a country where real gross domestic product has shrunk by almost 80% in a decade. Dollars are everywhere these days. Prices in stores, restaurants and even food carts are listed in dollars. This has partly stabilized prices and brought a veneer of better economic times. <laughs> Together with more favorable international geopolitics, this has allowed Maduro to venture outside the country, shaking hands with leaders who were trying to house them until a few months ago and confounding opponents. Juan Guaidó demanded the United States and other democracies recognize as legitimate president after calling Maduro's 2018 re-election a sham, spends most of his days in a Spartan office. Photos on the wall show him at the height of his efforts to topple Maduro, and although opposition parties are now seeking to end his mandate, he remains on the third. We need to bring this to a presidential election, and we need to strengthen the opposition to facilitate talks in Mexico. But let me be clear, it's not because the opposition is divided that Maduro keeps the power. He keeps usurping power because this is a dictatorship. Maduro's regime has agreed, in theory, to resume negotiations with the opposition in Mexico and arrange free and fair presidential elections in 2024 in exchange for eased US sanctions on the oil sector. Maduro is hoping the economy will continue improving enough to give him a chance to win the next presidential elections outright, especially if the opposition remains as divided as it is right now. But economists say the improvements have done little for the majority of Venezuelans. Maduro is trying to credit himself for the increase in economic activity, but all they've done is stop causing hyperinflation. Still, if things stand, it will create some peace among the middle and upper class. But this doesn't mean better conditions for those who go to public hospital or need public services. But for now, avoiding hyperinflation might be enough to offer some opportunities to businesses like Adriana's and the government more time to maneuver. Alessandro Ampietti, Al Jazeera, Caracas. We'll introduce our guest shortly, but first let's take a look at how Venezuela reached this point. In 2019, Nicolas Maduro was sworn in for a second term as president, but the opposition had boycotted the 2018 elections, saying they were rigged. Opposition leader Juan Guaido had headed the National Assembly since earlier elections and declared himself interim president. The U.S. led around 60 Western and Latin American countries in recognizing him as leader, with some allowing him to appoint ambassadors. Maduro barred the U.S. humanitarian aid and cut diplomatic ties. The Trump administration replied with crippling sanctions, including on vital oil exports. Up to five million people were forced to leave Venezuela. Western allies gave Guaido control of the country's foreign assets. 
Domestic support for him withered after he failed to take power. Most EU countries backed Guaido but dropped their recognition of him as president last year. But the US continues to recognize him. And let's bring in our guest from Caracas, Tamir Parasi, is the Managing Director of Global Sovereign Advisory and was previously Deputy Foreign Minister, Advisor to President Hugo Chavez and Chief of Staff to President Nicolas Maduro in New York, Vanessa Neumann. She is the founder and CEO of Asymmetrica, a political risk firm. She's also the former official representative for Juan Guaido in uh, the United Kingdom and Ireland and also from Caracas, Phil Gunson. He's a senior analyst at the International Crisis Group and a consultant on Latin America. A warm welcome to you all. I'd like to begin in New York with you, Vanessa. Um, your guy has failed. It's time to back a new horse, surely. Well, I think, you know, there was a joke about the interim government that it's not interim, nor does it govern. So I think that that unfortunately gained a lot of currency. And I, I'm on record even since my resignation in 2020 that if this was not going to achieve its objectives, Venezuela needed to get out of the Maduro versus Guaido dialectic and do something to benefit the people. Uh, you know, the long-suffering Venezuelan people. So, uh, yeah, I think it, I'm not sure about whether it's backing a new horse or finding a way to basically ease that suffering, to bring infrastructure development, uh, to bring uh, proper humanitarian help, and not just in the ways of handouts, but things that are really considered basic to human development and, and, and human rights. And I think that that's where, where we need to go now. It's time to end the dialectic and time to, to find a solution for the Venezuelan people. Uh, in Caracas, uh, Tamir Porras, I mean, what do you think of that? It's time to stop this sideshow effectively. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the um, so-called interim government was uh, set up as part of the uh, regime change policy that was pushed back in the days by the Trump administration. And, and very clearly, that policy failed for, uh, you know, for various reasons. It is, it is time now to move on by de-recognizing that interim government by the United States in the sense that it creates the, the existence, you know, the formal existence, even if it has no impact in Venezuelan politics, it creates a lot of problems regarding, for instance, the legal recognition of the Venezuelan government in the United States, the access to uh, Venezuelan foreign assets, and uh, even, you know, the turnaround of Venezuelan economy, engagement with, you know, with the global economy, international financial institutions, a, a range of problems that are created by the existence of this um, now irrelevant uh, so-called interim government. Phil Gunson, uh, also in Caracas, uh, one of the key players here is the United States. It's sticking to its guns. It's backing the interim government. It continues to recognize uh, Juan Guaido. What is the point of that now? Uh, there really is no point. I mean, I think that the Biden administration has long wanted to move beyond this policy, which, of course, it inherited from Trump, not only in terms of recognizing Juan Guaido uh, uh, as the president of Venezuela, but also uh, the whole package of sanctions that, that Trump had imposed and the overall uh, you know, so-called maximum maximum pressure policy. I think this, you know, this move will make things slightly easier. In the short term, it's clearly a massive victory for President Maduro and, and a lot of people, even even people on the moderate side, internationally and 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 domestically here in Venezuela, in the opposition, have been reluctant to give Maduro that that prize, if you like, that 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 benefit without any significant concessions on his side. But I think that, you know, that stems from, uh, you know, an idea that somehow the so-called interim government is an asset to the opposition, whereas, in fact, it's been an obstacle, not only, um, not only in terms of the overall strategy, but also in terms of, you know, what, what the relationship between the opposition leadership and the Venezuelan public is. I think it's, it's distanced the opposition leadership from the real concerns of, of Venezuelans and also caused a split or further splits, if you like, within the opposition itself. Uh, Vanessa, these are two very strong personalities here. They are people with significant right. support. Uh, is there a compromise to be found that leads Venezuela out of this crisis? Well, significant support, I'm not sure I agree with that statement, first of all. I wanted to reinforce and agree with some things that Phil Gunston said. Um, and Tamir said, and but out a bit of nuance. I think, first of all, I don't think Nicolás Maduro or Juan Guaido really have that much support. Uh, there are analyses that Guaido may not make it out of the primaries. 
That's not for me to say. That's to be determined uh, by the facts as we approach the 2024 election. Um, so, you know, the polling is bad for both sides. So I wouldn't say really either side has support. It's a little bit unclear who would emerge as a strong uh, leader um, or option really on either side. Obviously, Nicolás Maduro would stay as the leader for the regime. But um, what, what is interesting about what has happened with the recognition and, and what might happen with the foreign assets and everything going forward, as you know, I was instrumental in the defense of the gold, of the sovereign gold in the Bank of England so, and gave not, no fewer than 19 witness statements in that case. So I know it well. So what has happened is I think a lot of the foreign assets, even if the Guaido, shall we say, is de-recognized officially by his own people and the international regime, you'll end up with a Nini situation. Remember that those assets were frozen because of the illegitimacy of the Maduro regime pending free and fair elections. So there is a scenario where that might all just remain frozen until there is free and fair elections in 2024. That premise does not go away. I do agree that it has separated with the, the Venezuelan uh, opposition leadership from the people who, frankly, are just fed up with politics and want to get up, uh, get on with a solution to their lives. Um, and I think, but what, ironically, one of the things is, as you try and move forward and try and find a solution towards the types of things that we have been talking about, about infrastructure development and perhaps finding a way to either use some of the foreign debt, which I'm involved in a couple of projects on this, so I'm advising on them, uh, whether to use some of the foreign debt or foreign assets that have been cleared or could be cleared in order to use that for some of these projects that would actually ease the suffering of the Venezuelan people and perhaps pull Maduro away from the Russian influence and more toward the West. Now, the thing is, to do that, uh, you have to find a way that they can't be entirely isolated from the international uh, financial community. Because let's just say, even if you securitize or collateralize some of those investments, you know, what are you going to do? Go to court in Venezuela? Um, to, you know, if there's a default. So you need to find a path where even when you try and find these solutions, um, there, there, that there's a way that you can still enforce internationally because in a completely financially isolated Venezuela, like North Korea or something, doesn't really, uh, doesn't provide investors or um, with any, um, any recourse, the type that you would need. So I think that the solution would have to be Something, something along those lines, and that, and the, the, it's a real Rubik's cube of complexity to uh, find that path. Uh, Tamir, I mean, we're looking at then a stalemate, aren't we? We're looking at at least what eighteen months away before the next elections, uh, optimistically. So we're looking at a stalemate in Venezuelan politics that can't do any of the things that Vanessa may be suggesting. Well, I, I, I don't think so. Venezuelan politics have have, have been moving since uh, at least two thousand nineteen. First, in the sense that most of the opposition in Venezuela has moved away from, you know, the project of the so-called interim government, has engaged in uh, internal, in a process of internal negotiation with Chavismo, you know, this, the, the name we give to the, uh, the political movement around President Maduro, and, uh, you know, in a, in a very challenging uh, difficult, but but you know, ongoing process. Uh, the opposition and the government of Venezuela have focused on on discussing, which is which is already a progress uh, from the situation in 2019, uh, when you know phrases like "all options are on the table" pronounced by the uh, government of the United States, meaning a military threat against the uh, Venezuelan uh, government and and and, and Venezuela. Uh, in general, uh, was pronounced. So the, the, the situation politically has, has definitely um, improved. Uh, of course, there, there need to be, you know, uh, uh, concrete concessions on, uh, and, and when I say both sides is uh, the opposition is requesting from the government political concessions, uh, guarantees in order to uh, achieve free and fair elections. And the government on the other side is addressing a message that is more addressed to the, to the U.S. government than to its opposition, saying that in order to achieve free and fair elections, also for Chavismo, you know, this needs to be free and fair elections for all, Venezuela should not be subject to unilateral U.S. sanctions, which is, you know, what Vanessa was referring to. Today, the uh, Venezuelan government is under U.S. sanctions. It means it doesn't have access to the financial system. It, it, it doesn't have access to bank accounts, you know, to make it very concrete. 
And it's an oil producing country where the oil, uh, national oil company cannot uh, legally, I mean, from the perspective of, of the U.S. legal system, mm. but which is, you know, by the, the fact that the U.S. Uh, has great international influence, uh, it cannot engage even in oil trading. Venezuela cannot export officially its, its oil. So the impact on the Venezuelan economy is immense. And therefore, uh, the government is claiming that free and fair elections need to be uh, also sanctions free or sanctions released uh, elections. So we we are dealing with a with a with a, a timetable as you were mentioning that is dependent not only on the progress internally, but also on the progress of negotiate on the progress on the international uh, arena and and you know re, depending on what concessions the the Biden administration that has started a process of engagement in Venezuela mm -hmm. is willing to make. Well, Phil Gunson, let's talk about the international community. I mean, on the one side, you've got Cuba, China, Turkey, Iran and Russia backing uh, Maduro. And then you have the West uh, effectively in the EU at some points, probably a little bit less so right now. Are any of these countries, are any of these roles of these, this split between the international community, has any of it been useful for Venezuela? No, I mean, I think the polarization that you refer to, which, you know, the international polarization obviously reflects the domestic polarization. Um, and this has become, you know, from originally being a domestic Venezuelan crisis, it's extended into the region with a massive migration crisis, absolutely unprecedented refugee crisis. Um, Seven million Venezuelans are estimated to have left the country out of a population of around 30 million. That's creating enormous pressures within the region. Uh, lots of other aspects of the crisis obviously affect Venezuela's neighbors. And, and then now it's a global geopolitical crisis as well, in the sense that it you know, when, when uh, you know, US, Russia and China, if they ever do sit around a table, um, you know, Venezuela is, is, is on the agenda. So it may not be at the top, certainly, but it's, uh, but it's an item there. And this, is not, this has not been useful. Um, that, what that does mean, of course, is, as Tamir was saying, is that, the, you know, the, the US and its allies and uh, Maduro's allies in the form of um, the Russians, the Chinese, the Iranians and so on, uh, have a role in resolving this. And the focus, of course, has to be on the talks that have recently resumed in Mexico City, beach, formally between the Maduro government and what's called the unitary platform, the, um, at least a portion of the opposition that's in, that's in negotiation with the government. That has to be backed, solidly backed, by um, the international community. But also, those talks have to be connected in some way to the Venezuelan people, to Venezuelan civil society. At the moment, they're operating almost in a vacuum. And, and again, as, as Tamir mentioned, the, the, the reality of those talks is that they are, in essence, a negotiation between Caracas and Washington, in which the opposition is kind of an instrument, but it isn't really, it doesn't really have an awful lot uh, to put on the table. So the, the, there needs to be a way in which those talks, and what's decided that those talks, is connected back to what Venezuelans on the ground here and Venezuelan organized civil society really wants through consultation mechanisms which are in the memorandum of understanding under which those talks were set up. Uh, Vanessa, uh, that's a pretty pessimistic uh, assessment of the international community's role. Is there, any, is there any optimism here when it comes to the international community? Any optimism? Well, I mean, I think that there's plenty. I just think that the sort of geopolitical chess games, you know, will will continue apace. I mean, there are other options for Venezuelan development as well that would play key that uh, key things, including in helping Europe get through the Ukrainian war. I mean, there are there are, the importance of Venezuela has really been underexplored, and it's not just about the oil. There are tremendous other resources, including a tremendous amount of natural gas, more than Qatar, actually. That um, that that are that are strategically important uh, minerals and also you know it's it's geographic importance in terms of for international shipping lanes and all of that. So I think that there's uh, there's lots of things that you know can can be done in Venezuela and that actually weren't done because of the terrible kleptocracy and corruption and mismanagement really under the under the under Chavismo. Now granted. I've always said that there was actually mismanagement and corruption prior to Chavismo. So that's not really new to Venezuela, but it really grew exponentially. And I agree that, uh, and I, I agree and I disagree with some things that Phil Gunson said. For instance, I think that the negotiations in Mexico 
are are, are sort of somewhat irrelevant because I, I, I do agree with him um, that that they are basically a, a proxy between Washington and, and the opposition. The problem with the opposition, one of the many reasons why I resigned, is they didn't really seem to have, you know, a what do they want? I and other Venezuelans ask, um, you know, you guys sitting down at the table in Mexico, what is your list of demands? I'm a Venezuelan citizen. I'm supposed to be represented by you. What is your list of demands? Can you please tell us? And they can't. Uh, I know what Chavismo wants, but I don't know what the opposition wants. And that's not, you know, as you know from political negotiations, anywhere in the world, where it's Middle East peace or Northern Ireland, if you don't know what the list of demands is, you're in serious, you're in serious trouble. So uh, it's complicated. Uh, it's very complicated. But Tamir, uh, one of the things that seems to be coming out here right now is the idea that whoever controls the foreign assets is going to be the de facto leader of Venezuela. Is, uh, is that crucial for the future? What, what, what is crucial for the future is uh, for Venezuela, who is, uh, again, an oil-based economy, to, uh, to turn around its uh, oil sector, oil and gas, as Vanessa mentioned, by the way, because they, Venezuela is home to uh, massive untapped reserves of gas that could be of use, especially, as you mentioned, to Europe. Um, so what, what, is, what is really of the essence is to let the Venezuelan society to uh, basically take care of its own development, which it can't at the moment. Uh, unfortunately, the, the economic situation of the country has improved. Uh, since 2021, Venezuelan economy is growing again, but that is mostly the effect of internal reforms that were passed by the government. And, and you were mentioning to whoever, I mean, who, who runs the country, there is absolutely no doubt that it is the government sitting in Caracas that is presided by, by Nicolas Maduro, um, the access to foreign assets is uh, at the same time symbolic, uh, something that is, uh, you know, that pertains to the sovereignty of the country. Um, regardless of the opinion uh, one could have on, on how the country is ruled, the mm. fact is that those assets belong to uh, the state of Venezuela, so it should be under the control of the Venezuelan government. And again, the Venezuelan economy has, has uh, started to grow. So, uh, Tamir, we are running out of time. Reports. Sorry, we are running out of time. And I do want to come uh, very quickly to Phil Gunson. Once more, Phil, uh, the, paint, the picture that's being painted here was that this could have been a very simple domestic political dispute, but it was made worse by international involvement. No, I wouldn't put it that way. I, I mean, I think this is a very complex um, domestic dispute, which essentially, um, you know, has to do with um, the dismantling of Venezuelan institutions. The fact that the, you know, the opposition is, uh, has a certain space within which to operate, but cannot challenge Chavismo for national power. Um, and so long as that remains the case, then, you know, the, 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 the logjam will continue. Um, the importance of Mexico, I mean, I understand what Vanessa was saying about, uh, you know, that, that Mexico is kind of irrelevant, but Mexico is the place at which, you know, in which uh, agreements that have to do, obviously, not just with the opposition, but with the US as well, and the Venezuelan government, that these, that these agreements can be ratified. And it's a process more than they don't sit down in Mexico and, and discuss these things, they're discussed elsewhere. It's the process that I'm referring to. That negotiating process, which ought to work according to the plan of the Biden administration reciprocally, so that concessions on the Maduro side are met with sanctions relief primarily from the US. That ought to work, but it needs to be kick-started by a, a, you know, a government here in Caracas that is willing actually to contemplate down the line at some point losing power, which currently it doesn't seem to be willing to do. I want to thank all our guests, uh, Temir Paras, uh, Vanessa Neumann and Phil Gunson. I want to thank you as well for watching. Now, you can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Imran Khan and the whole team here, bye for now.